On November 17, 1925, Roy Harold Shear Jr. was born in Winneka, Illinois, the only child of Roy Harold Shear Sr., an auto mechanic, and Catherine Shear, who was born Catherine Wood, who was a homemaker. During the Great Depression, Hudson's father lost his job and abandoned the family. In 1932, his mother married Wallace Fitzgerald, a former Marine Corps officer whom young Roy despised. The marriage ended in a bitter divorce and produced no children. Hudson attended New Trier High School in Winnetka, the same high school as Charlton Heston and Anne Margaret. He worked as a movie usher and developed an interest in acting. Although he tried out for a number of school plays, he failed to win any roles because he could not remember his lines. Hudson graduated from high school in 1943 and the following year enlisted in the U.S. Navy during World War II. He was an aircraft mechanic until 1946, the year of his discharge. Hudson moved to Los Angeles to live with his biological father and pursue an acting career. He worked at odd jobs, including as a truck driver. He applied to the University of Southern California's Dramatics program, but was rejected due to poor grades. After he sent talent scout Henry Wilson a picture of himself in 1947, Wilson took him on as a client and changed his name to Rock Hudson. Hudson was signed to a long-term contract by Universal International. His first screen credit was in Undertow, released in 1949. He had small parts in Peggy, released in 1950, Winchester 73, also released in 1950, uh, The Desert Hawk, also released in 1950, Tomahawk, released in 1951, and Air Cadet, also released in 1951. He was billed third in The Fat Man, released in 1951, and was promoted to leading man for Scarlet Angel, released in 1952, opposite Yvonne DiCarlo. He also starred in Has Anybody Seen My Gal, also released in 1952. By now, Hudson was firmly established as a leading man in adventure films. His breakthrough role came in the romantic drama Magnificent Obsession, released in 1954, co-starring Jane Wyman. But his popularity soared with George Stevens' film Giant, released in 1956, in which he co-starred with James Dean. He and Dean were nominated for Oscars in the Best Actor category. He also starred in Written in the Wind, uh, released in 1957, directed by Douglas Sirk, which was a hit. Sirk also dress directed Hudson in Battle Him, released in 1957, which was produced by Hudson. These films propelled Hudson to be voted the most popular actor in American cin cinemas in 1957. Ross Hunter teamed Hudson with Doris Day in the romantic comedy Pillow Talk, released in 1959, which was a massive hit. Hudson was voted the most popular star in the country for 1959 and was the second most popular for the next three years. He also made The Last Sunset, released in 1961 with Kirk Douglas, which was less popular, and uh, Come September, in, also released in 1961 with Gino Lola Brigida. The Spiral Road, released in 1962, and uh, he also made two movies with Doris Day, um, Lover Come Back, released in 1961, and Send Me No Flowers, released in 1964. Strange Bedfellows, released in 1965, with Gino Lola Brigida again, was a box office disappointment, and so was A Very Special Favor, also released in 1965. He appeared in Blindfold, released in 1966, and Seconds, also released in 1966, which was co-produced with his own film production company, Gibraltar Productions. So his, his name was Rock Hudson. His production company was Gibraltar. Rock of Gibraltar. Get it? Um, he next appeared in the action film To Brook, released in 1967, Directed by Arthur Hiller and co-produced by Gibraltar Productions and The Corman Company. I bought this DVD 
at Amazon for the budget price of $5.99, which is well below my self-imposed limit of $13.91. Uh, therefore, this DVD does qualify for a low-budget review. Tobruk. Bubble is 90 miles from Suez. Every shell, every gallon of petrol he gets has to come 300 miles from Tobruk. How in the hell are we supposed to get through their defenses now? Drive through, Major. One of the most incredible Allied missions of World War II, the quest for Tobruk. It's time to a movie. A handful of men are asked to battle the Nazis across 800 miles of the Sahara Desert. That's the easy part. The hard part lies at the end of the journey, where knocking out the big guns at Tobruk means the difference between defeat or victory for the Allies. I think I can get up that, Colonel. You pull those tanks and I'll give you the fuel bunkers as a going away present. Best off I've had all day. George Pappard and Rock Hudson star in Arthur Hiller's Tobruk. The movie opens in September of 1942 with Canadian-born Major Donald Craig, played by Rock Hudson, of the Long Range Desert Group being captured by Vichy French forces and being held prisoner along with captured Italian army soldiers on a ship in a port in Algiers. But he is rescued by Captain Kurt Bergman, played by George Pappard, who is of the Special Identification Group, and some of his men, German Jews serving with the British. The reason Craig was rescued is because the Germans are only 90 miles from the Suez Canal, but they are dangerously low on fuel, which is supplied by a fuel depot in Tobruk. The British approve a plan to destroy German fuel bunkers in Tobruk in an attempt to cripple Erwin Rommel's attack. And it just so happens that Major Craig authored the plan of attack. Now, the plan calls for the British to drive through enemy territory posing as prisoners of war, escorted by the Special Identification Group, pretending to be guards. And again, the Special Identification Group consists of uh, German Jews, so it would be convincing that they would be Nazis. Uh, once they reach Tobruk, they would link up with a full British naval and RAF assault on the city and attack Rommel's underground fuel bunkers. Craig, meeting up with Lieutenant Colonel John Harker, who's played by Nigel Green, who apparently like, uh, played uh, similar roles as a British officer with a stiff upper lip, who is the commander of the British commandos, is skeptical of the operation. He states that uh, when they sub he submitted the plan, uh, they could have blown up the fuel bunkers with a handful of men. By the time it was not approved. Now the task would be nearly impossible as it would be difficult to get through German defenses. Still, they venture out disguised as prisoners and escorts. Their first obstacle is a patrol of Italian tanks, which stops a short distance from where they are resting in a gully. Uh, there is another tank column approaching, which the men survives are Germans. They trick the two units into attacking each other, then the long-range desert group sneak away. Craig thinks that they have drawn attention to themselves so they take a shortcut through a German minefield, uh, which Craig safely guides them through. They are then attacked by a British Curtis P-40 Warhawk fighter, mistaking the commandos for German forces. Uh, they manage to shoot it down, but not before eight men are killed, all of them Bergmans, and one troop transport truck. Their auxiliary fuel supply and both their radios are destroyed. The fighting attracts Arabs who are friendly with the Germans. Craig, who speaks their language, exchanges guns and ammunition for two prisoners. The prisoners turn out to be British traders Henry Portman and his daughter Cheryl, who were shot down while flying from Benghazi to Cairo. They have papers signed by the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, 
which is an agreement for a group of important Egyptian army officers to rise up against the British in a holy war. The Germans think that with Egypt conquered, other former Ottoman Empire provinces and Turkey will then side with the Axis, with Turkey alone putting 4 million men to the war against the Soviet Union. That night, the Portmans are told by a special identification group member who's actually a traitor about the fact that the British are pretending to be captured and where to find a gun and a map to an underground telephone cable nearby uh, where they can contact German command Tobruk and alert them to the British and the upcoming attack. But when they reach the telephone, they're spotted by an Italian patrol. Portman fires at the patrol, who return fire and he is killed, and his daughter is seriously wounded. Harker sends Bergman after the Portmans, and they retrieve uh, Cheryl from the Italians. When Sergeant Krug, who's played by Leo Gordon, asks Bergman how they knew about the telephone, Bergman replies, very simple, one among us is the enemy. Harker has Bergman and his men disarmed and gives Bergman two hours to identify the traitor. But the traitor kills Cheryl, so she cannot identify him. Lieutenant Max Monfield, played by Guy Stockwell, who is Bergman's second in command, appears from the tunnel the Portmans used to escape. He states that the traitor is down the shaft. They find Corporal Bruckner stabbed to death, which satisfied Harker that Brookman was responsible. But Bergman is not convinced that Bruckner was the traitor, as they are friends for ten years. The group passes through checkpoints outside of Tobruk, and they discover that Rommel has amassed two full panzer divisions in Tobruk. This puts them the planned naval assault in jeopardy, but without their radars, they have no way of warning staff, unless they take the German transmitter, which would also alert the Germans. The group assaults the fuel bunker just as the RAF starts bombing Tobruk. The long-range desert group uh, blow up two of the harbor guns and Harker orders Sergeant Major Tyne to signal the ships to abort the landings. Harker orders Lieutenant Boyden to capture the German transmitter in the city, but he is killed during the bombing raid, as are Privates Alfie and Dolan, but not before they discover millions of pound notes the Germans had taken after capturing Tobruk. Bergman and three of his men escape on sidecar motorcycles and try to buy Harker time, but they themselves are killed. Meanwhile, Craig, Krug, and two other Sigmen use the distraction to seize a German tank, which they use to destroy the fuel depot. Once they do this, Harker and his men surrender. Uh, after surrendering, Monfield appears, where he reveals that he is really a German intelligence officer named von Kruger, explaining that he had told the truth the night before that, that the traitor is in the tunnel, and asks Harker for the Kessel Ring document. But Harker burned the paper, and he says something interesting, which is, as soldiers, we have few saving graces. Perhaps our willingness to die for what we believe is all that matters. He then uh, produces his pistol and shoots Von Kruger, and uh, he is himself killed. So both Von Kruger and uh, and Harker die. Uh, Craig Krug and two others manage to escape and exhausted after traveling over 70 miles on foot, are rescued by a Royal Navy ship and Salem just over the Egyptian border. As soldiers, we have few saving graces. Perhaps our willingness to die for what we believe is all that matters. So is our last words of Lieutenant Colonel John Harker in Tobruk. This movie is essentially a hist historical fiction based on World War II. And on a personal level, I'm fascinated by World War II. Um, I think it's embedded into the minds of most Americans. Um, so what makes World War II interesting is that it's basically a morality play. Um, Hitler came to power in 1933 as Chancellor of Germany. Um, he actually did it at 43 years old, uh, which is younger than I am now. And so he came to power based on uh, two, two, two of his platforms were uh, increased prosperity for, for Germans and, and an improvement of, of uh, 
uh, German power um, on the world stage. Um, and he he initially accomplished both of these. He uh, absorbed parts of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, and um, this became uh, a problem to the Western Allies. He invaded Poland, and this caused uh, Great Britain and France to declare war on Germany. So, essentially, um, Nazi Nazi Germany, under Hitler's leadership, um, attacked the Low Countries in France, and and, uh, and uh, France fell. And and the fall of France is essentially the same as the fall of Great Britain, because. Great Britain stayed in the war, but only by becoming a client state of the United States. Um, so then, you see, like, at this point, uh, Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of Great Britain um, under a coalition government, and Hitler wanted peace with Great Britain, but Churchill refused. And why did he refuse? Well, uh, probably because he thought that if he could hold out, then uh, Hitler would make a mistake. He'd do something stupid. And uh, that only took about a year for that to happen. So basically, uh, um, so fall of France happened in June of 1940. In June of 1941, um, Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union. Um, and then by the end of the year, the United States had joined the war. So, um, basically, uh, they had the coalition that would bring down the, the Axis. Um, although it would not become obvious in the immediate future, and seemed that the Axis was winning the war. Uh, the winning coalition had been forged and Allied victory was ensured. The turning point battles were... El Alamein in North Africa and Stalingrad in the Soviet Union. Um, eventually, Hitler's misadventures cost him uh, 300,000 men in North Africa. He lost three 300,000 men in Stalingrad. This was too big of a hole to climb out of. And although Nazi Germany had uh, many capable generals and many capable men, so did the Allies, and the combined manpower and firepower and productive capacity was too much, and therefore the Allies won World War II. So that's the morality play of, of uh, World War II, which is that Hitler had amassed power, and with power comes uh, corruption, with power comes uh, hubris, and with power comes missteps and miscalculations, and therefore he lost. And uh, you know the the miscalculations come from the United States in, in the post-war world. Um, but anyway, that was the, the morality play of World War II. Um, so Tobruk is a historical fiction that has Rommel's Africa Corps 90 miles from the Suez Canal. Uh, so this basically takes place uh, in the in the middle of the Battle of El Alamein. Um, in order to stop Rommel, the British decide to take out the German fuel depot in Tobruk. This assault actually happened. It happened in, uh, on September 13th and 14th of uh, 1942. Um, but unlike in the movie, it was a failure. That didn't affect the outcome of the, the battle, which Great Britain eventually won. But you can make a compelling wartime drama you present the idea that, but for the success of the mission, the battle will be lost. Um, and but for this battle, the war may be lost. El Alamein was seen as a turning point battle. If Rommel had won this battle, he may have captured Cairo, then the Suez Canal, and may have invaded the Middle East. This could have convinced Turkey that the Axis was winning, and Turkey could very well have joined the Axis, and, you know, they, they could have joined it, and they could deploy enough men against the Soviet Union, to, which could deliver the knockout punch on the Eastern Front. Of course, this is all just speculation, but that's what turning point battles do. They invite us to speculate. Um, 
They, will, they encourage you to think that if the battle had not had the outcome that it did, then the course of the war might have been different. That's one of the, one of the essential um, elements in, in a wartime movie. That, but for uh, the actions of the, of the people in this movie, that uh, the war could have had a different outcome. So now we have a compelling drama presented on this turning point battle. I think the distance between British force and, and Tobruk is, is 300 miles. This will require the British to sneak behind enemy lines, travel 300 miles, and assault Tobruk. In other words, it's a suicide mission. mission. But for a commando squad like the Long Range Desert Group, disguised as a prisoner of es escort, it might succeed. This movie is interesting because you start to see the different motivations of the men participating in it. There's Craig, play it. So this is interesting because uh, Rock Hudson is an American, and Americans and British didn't fight together, but uh, uh, Canadians and British did fight together. So he can play a Canadian. Um, so he's indispensable because he's formulated the plan, but. He's someone who isn't too eager to carry the mission out. out. Um, and as uh, as he says in the movie, uh, my my mother didn't raise any uh, any no hero. Um, there's also Harker who wants the mission to succeed, presumably for his own ego. There's Bergman played by George Pappard, so George Pappard gets to try out his his, his German accent. Um, so like the motivation of of, of his, his men is that they're German Jews fighting for the British who don't care much for the British but hope that their service will aid the cause of an independent Jewish state. There's also the underlings like Alfie uh, who have been forced to serve in Africa and Alfie's case is an alternative, alternative to prison. Oh, Alfie by the way is, is was played by Norman Nor the late Norman Rossington who, uh, and I knew that this, this man was familiar and apparently what it was that he was in, um, he played Norman, the xenophobic shop steward who locks horns with Kevin O'Grady, uh, played by Spike Milligan, in Curry and Chips, which was like a, a London weekend television, short-lived uh, London weekend television program from 1969. And there's the always insidious fifth column, the traitors within the organization threatening to disrupt the British plan by throwing a spanner into the works. So there you have the main protagonist. When they're not attacking the enemy, they're at each other's throats. Um, um, Tobruk is a movie that aired on independent uh, TV stations when I was uh, when I was a youth. I remember seeing this movie in 1983 or 1984, and like all movies, I remember watching it. Uh, uh, and I will. so I watched it again when I purchased this DVD, expecting to be disappointed in it. Because, you know, it's, I, I, if I liked it when I was young, I'd, I'd probably be disappointed in it now, right? Well, no. Happily, I wasn't. This movie is an exciting and compelling war drama. Uh, Leo Gordon, who um, is an actor in the movie and also uh, wrote the script, uh, his tightly written script it keeps us interested until the en end. The acting is good, and Rock Hudson and Nigel Green are convincing in their performances. Uh, George Pappard... Um, injects the right amount of realism and passion as the head of the special identification group tasked with rescuing Craig and ultimately to pose as escorts for the fake British prisoners. Um, the special effects are pretty good for the late 60s. In fact, a lot of the footage was used to enhance a nearly duplicate film or raid on Rommel four years later. So, then you get to see, like, one of the interesting elements of the movie is Rock Hudson as as an anti-hero. Um, so yeah, it's like you see, like Rock Hudson is, it says that uh, my mother didn't raise no he hero, um, so he's a, the, a reluctant hero. Um, but you know, like when the rubber meets the road, he he uh, takes over the tank and basically like destroys the fuel depot. Um, so I'm thinking like this probably would have been typical in, in a 1960s movie because yeah like uh, 1960s the cultural background was uh, the war in Vietnam so people were like a little bit more jaded than they were in the 1940s um, you had uh, 
the the um, Clint Eastwood spaghetti westerns where Clint Eastwood played like a, 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 a typical like anti-hero. But yeah, this is an interesting thing about Rock Hudson in this movie. Um, um, by the way, this movie was a commercial flop as it was made on a budget of six million dollars and only, and only grossed two million dollars. It received little attention from the critics, although most of what I've seen from the critics is favorable. Although Alf, Albert Whitlock and Howard A. Anderson were nominated for the Academy Award for Best Visual Effects, I hesitate to even call it a cult classic, because there's really no evidence of that either. But it's a very good movie with good writing, good acting, and good special effects. In conclusion, To Brook is a solid movie, and while it doesn't have a cult following, maybe I could help establish a cult for it. Here's a movie from my childhood that didn't disappoint. As, as a rating, I give it a 9 out of 10. It's pretty easy to summarize the DVD extras. There weren't any DVD extras here on the Universal Vault series release of the movie. Um, in fact, I thought there was something wrong with my D the DVD playback on my computer. Then I saw this on the back of the DVD case. This disc is expected to play back in DVD video play only devices and may not play in other DVD devices including recorders and PC drives. Well yeah, I, I got to work with my computer. I, I, the software that I used to play it back was a VLC media player. Uh, so there's no extras here but you, you might as well be watching it of VHS taste, tape. So no DVD extras and hence I was a little bit disappointed. I'm looking at the back of the case for this movie and it says like not rated. I think this this came out like before they had a rating system for movies. So like uh, G, P, G, R and NC-17. Um, so uh, I begin to think, like, what kind of ra rating would this movie have? It would probably be a PG movie, um, because uh, there's no nudity, there's no sex or sexual situations, there's no cussing, there's a lot of violence. In fact, there's there's one scene where Bergman uh, has a flamethrower and he, he uh, cooks his enemies. And uh, then he he dies and he he, he burns to death himself. Um, so that's pretty much the only the, like one of the uh, the only uh, some violence in. It. So I I'm guessing it probably would not get a a G rating. So it'd probably be PG. To Brook is a forgotten movie. Dare I say, almost a classic similar to other World War II movies, but well-written and the action scenes are very good. But the DVD extras, or should I say the lack of DVD extras, are a bit of a letdown. Therefore, I only recommend this movie. It's a good value for the money as it's only $5.99 and uh, in this day and age, that's a pretty good value. Um, but if you're expecting a lot of extras, you'd be wrong. Uh, that's it for this DVD review, and I have the the DVD that I'm going to use for next week, which is uh, uh, the late Jerry Bruckheimer's classic, uh, Falling Down. Um, so, apparently, um, in the last video, the music at some point drowns out the talking, so I decided this is something I should probably fix, so I reduced the volume of the music, so hopefully it's... Uh, it's, it will be satisfactory. Um, like the video and comment on it, and hit the subscribe button to be informed of the latest low budget review. As always, thanks for watching.